Let's pray together. Lord God, we pray for Alex and Melanie, for their family, for their ministry, for Tree Ministries. We pray for the work that you're doing through them. And I thank you in particular for one of the things that Melanie mentioned, that there are so many needs, so many physical, material needs that people have in Guatemala. And Lord, we know you care about each one of those needs, but also I thank you that Melanie and Alex understand that the greatest need is for the name of Jesus to be known by people there. And so, Lord, I pray that you would resource them to meet those physical needs as an expression of your love for people. But I also pray that you would give them great success and courage to share the gospel with the people that are there, Um, just that they would continue on that particular mission to help people meet Jesus and to make disciples. Would you bless the work that they're doing to that end? Um, Lord, I also want to pray for the the people whose names are on these banners up here, these are folks that we know from various parts of our life, places where we live and work and study and play. They're people that we care about. They're our friends and family and neighbors and coworkers. And Lord, their names are up here because it's our deep desire that they too would come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so we continue to ask that you would open their eyes and draw them to yourself and give us opportunities in our daily lives to minister to them and to point them to Jesus. And Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Um, We pray that this morning you would give us understanding as we look a little bit more deeply at Melchizedek and the Old Testament priesthood and a change in the law. Help us understand these things and help our lives Uh, align with these things, to be in accordance with what your word says. And I ask all of this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Read with me Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 through 14. It says, Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests." So the primary issue confronting us in our text today is that the Old Testament priests always came from the tribe of Levi. They were the sons or the descendants of Aaron. But Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. That's what verse 14 reminds us. So how is it that Jesus, who's from the tribe of Judah can end up being our great high priest when clearly in God's Old Testament economy for the priesthood, the priest always had to come from Levi. How does that work? And answering this question is part of the reason why the author of Hebrews has been spending so much time discussing this guy Melchizedek and Jesus being a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Because he's been proving to us that there is a kind of priesthood, even in the Old Testament, that is acceptable in the eyes of God, that came before even the priesthood of Levi and Aaron. And this all foreshadows and prepares us to see Jesus as our great high priest. So the fact here is God has not changed his mind in making Christ our priest. All of his plans and purposes were ordained before the foundations of the world. Everything he does is purposeful. And the author of Hebrews is telling us Melchizedek helps us see that. God was not making, God was not changing his mind in making Melchizedek our, or making Jesus a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Although Jesus was from Judah, Jesus has been a priest forever. And Melchizedek reveals that. Now, this apparent change, okay, from the priesthood of Levi and Aaron to the priesthood of Christ, 
We're told here it's permissible for two reasons. Verse 11 helps us understand this. First, because the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek was actually established before the Levites, before Aaron. So which is the older, more foundational ministry? Well, the ministry of Jesus as represented by the ministry of Melchizedek. In other words, if you want to play this game where older is better, right? At the bottom, what is there? Actually, what's older even than the priesthood of Levi is the priesthood of Melchizedek. So we can say, in a sense, the ministry of Christ is better than the ministry of the Old Testament priests because it was represented there in Melchizedek long before God established the Levites or the priesthood of Aaron. And this was all part of God's plan to have a transcendent priesthood in his son Jesus long before. Now, the second reason why this change in the priesthood is permissible is because there was never perfection to be attained in the old priesthood, the Old Testament. And this is a really probably more important point than the first one. Verse 11 is basically telling us that if salvation was to be found in the old system, then Jesus would never have needed to come. So read it with me again. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, then what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Not too long ago, I remember finding myself in a conversation with a guy who I kind of casually knew. This is a guy who calls himself a Christian, and he was explaining to me how he has decided, giving up, or he's decided to give up eating pork. Because he's been reading the Old Testament and, you know, the Israelites were forbidden from eating unclean foods like pork. And, um, you know, I, I found myself thinking I would never give up bacon at this point in my life. It's one of the four fundamental food groups. But, um, but he said, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. I want to do what the Bible says. And I've been reading the Bible and God's people in the Old Testament, they don't eat pork. So I've given it up. And I told him, man, I think that's really interesting. So I assume then you're following all 613 laws of the Old Testament. How's that going? And he looked at me rather sheepishly. He really didn't have any idea what I was even referring to because he didn't really even know what he was talking about. In contrast, the author of Hebrews knows exactly what he's talking about because he is sharing with us the revelation of the Holy Spirit. He's speaking through the wisdom of the Spirit of God. And he tells us in verse 11 that this old system that governed the Israelites was inadequate to bring perfection. That's why we as Christians don't try and keep the Old Testament law, because it is inadequate to bring perfection. Now, verse 11 also points out the two parts of that old system that fall short. You have first the ministry of the priests, and you have the teaching of the law. So let's deal with each of these real quick. The ministry of the priests was primarily the sacrifices that were taking place in the temple. And it, again, if you read the Old Testament, what you find is that uh, God's expectation was that pretty much 24-7 there would be a constant stream of blood flowing from the temple because there would be animal sacrifices taking place to atone for the sins of the Israelites. Now, I hate to spoil the fun for us as we get further in Hebrews, but flip to chapter 10 with me and look at Hebrews 10 verse 4. This is an imp important verse. And it says, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So all of that work that the priests were doing there in the temple, sacrificing all of those animals, it was entirely ineffectual to cleanse any sin. And if you don't have forgiveness of your sins before God, then you remain 
imperfect. You are still stained and tainted by your sin. To be terribly blunt then, the priesthood of the Levites literally accomplished nothing. It did nothing except to show people their need for salvation in some other way, a truly acceptable sacrifice. In other words, all of the work of the priests to sacrifice in the Old, Test Old Testament did nothing except to prepare the people to receive Jesus as their sacrifice, Christ who could really take away the sins of the world. So no perfection through the Old Testament priesthood. What about the law? Because the law and the ministry of the priests go together. So like that man that I was speaking to who said that he had given up pork, can we just give up eating bacon and keep the Old Testament law and then through that process find perfection? Well, I think any honest person who is willing to evaluate just the last week of their life would probably also have to admit that they're far from perfection, right? Just something as simple as the Ten Commandments, throw aside the 613 laws of the Old Testament, just the Ten Commandments. How have you done keeping even those over the last week? Now, sure, if the standard were that we should be a good person, well, then maybe we might attain to that expectation. But that's not the standard. The standard is perfection, right? Verse 11, if perfection had been attainable. Never breaking God's law at any point ever through the course of your entire life, that is God's standard. So the law only serves to show us that we are not perfect because we always fail to keep it. This is why Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says this, For by works of the law, no one will be justified in God's sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So no perfection through the sacrificial system of the priesthood, no perfection attainable through the law. So the whole system of the Old Testament then is bankrupt as far as perfection and righteousness are concerned. You can't be perfect through the sacrifices. You can't be perfect through trying to keep the law. But the Old Testament system is not, therefore, totally useless for us. Because just like Melchizedek, this system points us to our need for Jesus. And this is what the author of Hebrews has been getting at. Because the Old Testament system was inadequate to reconcile man to God, a new system was necessary. A new priesthood. A new law. Perfection offered to us by God's grace through the sacrifice of Jesus not through our own efforts. And this might come as a surprise to us to see such a huge change. I mean, if you were to begin reading your Bible in Genesis and keep reading, you might begin to feel like it's really, really important to God that this system is in place. And then all of a sudden you get into the Gospels and Jesus seems to be kind of unraveling the whole thing. And you might think, what's going on here? It, this change certainly came as a surprise to the Jews which is why they had such a difficult time accepting Jesus as Messiah and understanding the things that he was teaching. But here's what you need to know. It was never a surprise to God. This was always the plan. That's why Melchizedek came before the Levites and before Aaron. And that's why Abraham was praised for his faith before the law and before circumcision. From the very beginning, it was always God's plan to eventually drive his people to this plan, this point. Salvation through the work of his son Jesus by faith in the righteousness of Christ. This was always what God intended. This is why Melchizedek was king of righteousness and king of peace and why he came before the Levites. 
Because we cannot address our moral problems through our own human efforts. It's not possible. And if you've been trying that, you know how wearisome it is. We cannot keep the law. We cannot be good enough on our own. We cannot attain salvation by our own efforts. We need a king of righteousness to represent us. We cannot atone for the wrongs that we have done in the past through the ministry of human priests or the blood of sacrificial animals. We need a priest who is God himself, a priest who is eternal, a priest who in his essence is greater than all of our sins so that he can swallow them all up in his righteousness. And of course, that's all provided for us in Christ. So the author of Hebrews is telling us, actually, this was the plan from the very beginning, guys. Look at Melchizedek, and you can see the hints are there. So now that we've covered the basics of what these verses mean, I want to call your attention to verse 12. I've got a few more minutes, and I want to address one additional thing. Verse 12 says, For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Man, this is such an important point for us to understand. Because it was the law that established the priesthood. And if the priesthood goes away, then by necessity, the law must also change. So in this verse, the Holy Spirit is teaching us that as Christians, we are not under the priesthood of the Levites. We're not under the priesthood of Aaron. We are under the priesthood of Christ. And when the priesthood changes from the old system to the new system, the law also changes with it. And this is why we as Christians are not obligated to keep that Old Testament law. Jesus told us that he came to fulfill the law. And so in his perfect life, all of the righteous requirements of the law were satisfied. Jesus in his life never once broke a single one of those 613 laws. He kept all of the Ten Commandments every single day of his life. He never failed at one single point. And in living that righteous life, he fulfilled the requirements of the law. And now through his blood and by his ministry, which continues as he sits at the right hand of God the Father, he applies his righteousness to us by our faith in his work, and we are saved by virtue of his righteousness. But this does not mean that we are therefore without a law. We are under the law of Christ, who has saved us. Just as the Israelites were to obey the law of Moses, so we as Christians are to obey the law of Christ. That's the law that we live under. Not to earn our righteousness, not to be made right with God, but because we have been made righteous. And I cannot emphasize this enough to you. I really can't. Um, You know, too many people who call themselves Christians think that they have received grace and forgiveness from God, and then as a result, they're free to just do whatever they want. Maybe you know somebody like this. Maybe they're a coworker of yours, and they say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian too, but you watch their life and you don't see any evidence. Maybe you have a family member who claims something like this, oh, I'm a Christian, and yet they're just a nasty person. You don't see Jesus in them at all. Many people who say, I'm a Christian, think that it doesn't matter then how you live your life and nothing could be further from the truth. Precisely because we have been given the grace of God, we now live under this law of grace, which is to say that we obey the commands of Scripture By the grace that God gives to us, we obey the law of Christ through the righteousness of Christ that is now ours by faith. In love for our Savior, 
we do what he says when he tells us, follow me. You know, maybe you've been around our church for a while and you're like, Grady, I feel like you say this all the time. Why do you say this so much? Why does Maricopa Springs talk about this concept so often? And I just want you to understand, I'm going to continue to talk about this concept because the scriptures teach it and I continue to find people who don't believe it or don't understand it. That Christians have an obligation to do something because of what has been done for us. We're not under obligation to do something so that God will accept us, but we are under obligation to honor Jesus with our lives because he gave his life for us. We are under the law of Christ. Jesus summarizes that law for us in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 to 31. He says the whole law of God that we saw hinted in the Old Testament, it can be summarized like this. Love God and love other people. It's not complicated. We prove our love for God by obeying his commands. And we prove that we love God by loving others. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 says, How can you love God who you cannot see when you cannot love your brother whom you can see? Here's this God who's this idea who sometimes feels distant and detached from us. And yes, we're supposed to love him, but how can you do that when you don't very simply, tangibly love this person who literally is right here next to you? That's a contradiction. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. What is the proof of our love for God? It's obedience. So we need to be people who search the scriptures so we can know what Jesus teaches, so that we can then practice the things that he teaches. We must be people who willingly lay down our lives and take upon ourselves the life of Christ we must be people who reject the law of selfishness so that we can deny ourselves in order to live under the freedom that Christ offers us. The freedom of the law of Christ. The freedom to obey Jesus out of love for him. The freedom to put sin to death in order that we might make much of Christ as Lord. The freedom to give ourselves to others because God has given himself to us. Let me say it one final way. Christians are people who are free because they are no longer slaves to sin. And Christians are people who are free because they have willingly made themselves slaves of Christ. Let me say it again. We're free as Christians because we have cast off the tyranny of sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. And we are free because we have chosen to be slaves of Christ. We are people under the law of love. And we love God because he's transformed us. He's made us righteous. And so praise God that we are not under the crushing law of of the Old Testament, the law of perfection, but instead we are under the transforming love of God through the sacrifice that Christ has made for us.